scrouching, scrouching, just like screaming. My parents always thought I was just like screaming in the basement, but I was like singing if I was feeling a lot that day. I would just go into the basement, I would sing. Welcome to Story and Craft. Now, here's your host, Mark Preston. All right, here we go. Another episode of Story and Craft. How are you? Had a good week? Things been going okay? Hope everything's going great with you. Uh, If you're new to the show, thank you so much for stopping by, checking it out. Going to have a great episode this week. Really enjoyed this chat. I mean, I've had the good fortune of of sitting down with some really uh, interesting, intriguing people. But uh, this week, loved this chat. Melissa O'Neill, she plays Officer Lucy Chen on the ABC television show The Rookie. Uh, Great personality, a lot of energy, very insightful, just I really enjoyed this sit down. She was beyond a pleasure to chat with. Uh, We talked about being from Canada. Uh, She even won Canadian Idol at 17 years old. Uh, She's been on Broadway and uh, just just really enjoyed the conversation. And I think you will as well. Uh, Don't forget, if you would, pop on by Story and Craft pod.com once again story and craft pod.com the website everything you could possibly want to know about the show is right there and if you would as always uh, subscribe like the show on your favorite podcast app uh, leave a review drop a star whatever you do on your app all right so uh let's get after it uh this week is melissa o'neill week right here on story and craft How's your day been going so far? It's been a little crazy. You know, I think everyone else is in their own type of experience with COVID. But on our show, which I think is one of the only shows that hasn't been shut down by COVID, we have like pretty extreme protocols. And um, even if somebody is asymptomatic, but if they've tested positive, And even if they're beyond the CDC guidelines of like, if you're 10 days, even if you're still testing positive, as long as you're not symptomatic, you're fine to reintegrate. That is not the case on our show. And so it creates a lot of, um, it means that we're reshooting a lot of things. So I will shoot things twice. I'm gathering you're restraining a little bit of frustration right now. (laughs) I don't think I'm restraining it at all. This is an accurate representation of my general, um, uh, let's see. I'm just, it's, it gets a little mundane after a while. You're like, really this again? Oh, I think that's very common. Yeah. Everybody I'm speaking with, I I was talking with uh, an actor named Shea Wiggum the other day and he says, hang on, I got to go do something. He had to run to his front door because somebody came to his house to swab his nose. And I'm like, mm-hmm. it's things you d- don't even think of. Yeah. Well, we can blame it all on Nathan Fillion because he's technically the boss, right? So we'll just lay it all on his shoulders. No. <laughs> no, that's silly. How are you? Doing very well, actually. Now, uh, your your folks said you had a uh, chat with your producer, so I gave me a chance to go and uh, I'd go and pop into my studio and record some stuff. Oh. So actually, it was very efficient. I got something out of the way it needed to get done. Do you work from home? I do. I do. Oh, cool. I took a break from acting because my teenagers were kind of aging to the point where it's like like my second kid's now going off to college. Whoa. And, and COVID and all that is like, you know, I'm just going to chill out at home. Uh, and I made Wait, it. Wait, does this mean you don't have anyone? At home anymore? Is was is that the last one? I got a sixteen year old daughter who's who's starting her junior year, so she uh, she's the last one. This is like a slow emptying of the nest. So I'm. Uh, How does that feel? Uh, hmm. That's a really good question. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Mm-hmm. Let me lay down on the sofa here and go <laughs> a little bit of therapy. No, actually, it's I'm so proud of them because of of who they are and where they're going. But it's like I have like a. Like on my on my monitors right here in my studio, I've got a picture of my kids back when they were like you know you know uh, nine, eight, and six, I think. And I'm sitting there going, "That was two seconds ago," I think. So it's kind of wild. They're getting off to school. Proud of them. I'm finding I'm trying to uh, evolve ways of busying myself because <laughs> I think I think once they're all off to school, then I think that's going to be uh, 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 an interesting uh, an interesting experience. 
Uh, but I'm actually, my youngest wants to go to school. She was looking at UCLA. Now it's Texas or something. So I'm going to be moving. Oh, out of state. Oh, yeah. She wants to get the heck out of Dodge. Now, I'm originally from Dallas, lived in Southern California, but now in New Orleans. Uh, so this is where my ex-wife lives here. So uh, so it's kind of like if you marry okay. somebody from New Orleans, whether you're still married to them or not, you always end up staying in New Orleans for a period of time, which this was kind of Hollywood South for half a second. So for, well, not half mm. a second. It was really busy before a lot of stuff went to Atlanta. That's right. But everybody from L.A. is moving to Texas, it seems like. So, you know, maybe I should... Texas or Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a a native Texan, so maybe I'm just kind of like... All the crazy politics there aside, it's a good good place Mm -hmm. to set up shop. But uh, now, now, Mm -hmm. you're originally from from Canada, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, Now, where in Canada are you from? I was born and raised in Calgary. I spent most of my time in Toronto, though, from the time I was 16. So you think casting uh, with Nathan Fillion had anything to do with the fact that you're from Canada? Do you think that gave you a leg up since he's from there as well? Or do you think that was not even a factor? (laughs) Well, probably not. But it doesn't hurt to have something to share with someone in the room. Yeah, he's, you know, every time I hear him, uh, whenever he's in an interview, he's such a he's such an affable guy. Uh, you know, he seems like he's... Have you met him? I have not. I've wanted to. My two oldest, my 19 and 8, well, well next in a few weeks, 18-year-old, love the rookie. You know, that's their thing. We all mm. That's kind of one of those few things we can still kind of sit down and watch together. They love watching the rookie, and mm. uh, and I believe you're, you're one of the favorite characters. So they're, I'm sure, going to be very jealous that they weren't here today. So, mm. But uh, y- y'all are going into season... Is it four? Is it is that what's about to start? We're filming season five right now. You're filming five right now. Okay. Now, going back to real quick, kind of hit and rewind to, to the origin story, uh, because I was very pleasantly surprised that the whole Canadian Idol thing, did that launch, do you know, roughly the same time as American Idol did? Or did it kind of come a few years later? Was it Was it kind of in parallel with what was going on down here? I don't know. I don't think so. I think that a few years of American Idol happened before Canadian Idol launched. I know in one of the episodes, uh, they, they, they alluded to the the whole American Idol thing. Was that something that they were just trying to work something in where, okay, we got to get her to sing somehow on an episode? I think that they were trying to include that. I don't, I'm not sure if they were aware of it, but, you know, we were airing around the same time. I think Idol was our lead in. And so it was like a fun way to, to do a crossover, and they decided to put that piece in. That was very cool. At that time, I didn't know that you had had one uh, Canadian Idol. I mean, they, you're very mm-hmm. young. You were like 17, 17, 18 when, when you won. Uh, what was that like mm-hmm. going back? I mean, I many moons ago, when I, I was roughly 17, I started working on the radio uh, in Dallas. And I thought that was kind of a heady thing. I thought it was all famous and stuff for like two seconds. But at that age, what's it like to actually have that much attention put on you? And you win, and now there is an expectation of performing. What was that like back then, being that age? It was really uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't think that, you know, if I could, um, I mean, maybe it's different now because a lot of young people with technology and Instagram and social media, there's a lot of... um, kids that are kind of trained from the time they're very young to be in front of cameras and to center themselves. Um, But at the time, it was really uncomfortable. (laughs) And I think a big part of that experience is what kind of led me to being interested in ensemble work and working in groups. I'm not terribly thrilled about being a solo act or a centerpiece. It's a lot of pressure and I don't really have any aspirations for fame yeah that's funny the thing you said about teenagers my 16 year old oddly she hates when i take pictures of her she can't stand her picture when Mm -hmm. her friends take pictures and want to post it on instagram she wants to have nothing to do with that which is kind of makes me happy Mm -hmm. a little bit because the the polar opposite is just you're right that's a really wonderful way of putting it they a lot of the kids now are trained um to showcase themselves. It's just a part of the zeitgeist, you know? It's like it's like the thing to do these days. Yeah, everybody's creating content, you know, and, and, and some of them's like I, I kinda like a little anonymity sometimes or you know, but but the question uh what immediately thereafter, after you won and you were you were you said you're working on ensemble stuff. You're working on stage and what were you doing predominantly on stage 
and the second half of that question is, um, how did that end up leading to you being on camera? Hmm. Uh, I think I was on tour at the time when I got a call to audition for a stage production that ended up running for quite a while. We did the North American premiere of Dirty Dancing, and I think they were having a hard time finding like a pop singer. And so that's how I landed onto that show. And I really loved working in an ensemble group. It was exciting to be um, doing something creative with my voice, not needing to be the centerpiece, especially as like a young person who wasn't terribly comfortable in their body. And, um, and to also have the opportunity to really work with people who had a pedigree, you know, because I left, I didn't go to post-secondary. I was out of high school at a very young age and then working. And it was really educational and inspiring to be around people who had gone to post-secondary for acting, for dancing, for singing. They were so knowledgeable. And I learned a lot during the eight, 10 years. Wow. Wow. That is kind of a big maturing phase. Yeah, it really was. I can't imagine being that age, uh, being on your own touring. Is it like American Idol where after the show, I guess top 10 or so the top the finalists, if you will, all go on tour together? Is that kind of how it works? Uh, no, it was just um, the runner up and I. We toured, I think we did like 36 cities. But I mean, do you remember the summer? the two months of your summer when you were 17? Yes. Like, it's it's a really, like, brief... Oh, well, that sounds like it must have been a really good summer. That would be very <laughs> curious to hear about that. Well, I can neither confirm nor deny. about the radio station. No, uh-huh. it's no, it funny because my focus uh, was was on was on work. Where, where I was talking with my daughter, the one who wants to go off to college somewhere else, and I said, you know, one of the, one of the regrets I had in school was that... Um, I didn't focus as much on the fun and the social. I was focused on where I wanted to go. And that's, you know, so weekends I was working mm-hmm. on the radio and I was just so focused on work. I forgot to stop and be 17 or 18, you know, mm-hmm. I'm making up for it now, I guess. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that is, that's pretty young to be kind of out there on your own and, and touring. Now, are you uh, in your family, the only one who sings or does something theatrical or acts or do you come from a family of uh, performers? I mean, they perform in their own way, but I wouldn't say that they do it professionally or for a living. I think for a long time, my family, my mom in particular, because she's Chinese, she was just like waiting for me to have some type of backup plan. (laughs) But, you know, it's over like I was, you know, I got into it. I think I auditioned when I was still 16. I turned 17 on the show. And I just turned thirty four. Like I've been, so wait, I've been you doing turned this now seventeen on the for, show. So you're sixteen when you started. Wow. Okay. Yeah, when I auditioned. Yeah. Um. So it's been a long time. <laughs> well, I, I was enamored. I caught a video. Uh, your your mother's from Hong Kong, correct? Mm-hmm. Which I have a great love for Hong Kong. My grandfather, my late grandfather, used to uh, work in women's fashions and clothes. There's just stuff he had manufactured in Hong Kong. That was back when made in China had kind of a negative connotation. But Hong Kong has mm. always been like he would go every year and have a suit made. You know, every every time he went to mm. Hong Kong, I always have wanted to travel there. And um, and the food is really what I'm kind of down with checking out. And I happen to run across a video of your your mother showing you how to make spring rolls and talking about exploding spring roll uh I, I'm, I'm curious did you catch a lot of the or did you uh, absorb a lot of the the uh, cooking from your mother over the years you know my mom makes all sorts of food one of the best dishes i remember her making is actually jamaican jerk chicken she's just a really exceptional cook um but no i don't think i learned a lot i think my mom kind of was separated from her heritage in a really big way because she left when she was a teenager really and so yeah it's been a process of reclamation to reconnect with my heritage and it's happened incidentally um and you know we also know how to play the part so when we were asked to take part in heritage month we're like well let's make some spring rolls (laughs) you know my mom loves spring rolls though and her 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 spring rolls are amazing and delicious but um 
Yeah. I mean, it would have been kind of funny if we kind of like popped on and like made jerk chicken, though, wouldn't it? No, that <laughs> that would have been awesome. That would have been like, I did not expect that. And no, the, well, my kids and I just yeah. were down on a, a cruise. And we went to Montego Bay and we went to this place called Scotchies in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. And they grilled. I mean, it's old school. They don't use like grill grates. They use sticks like wood, you know, and they grill. I'm telling yeah. you, if you're ever in Jamaica, this place, I, I think like yeah. um, Anthony Bourdain and like Andrew Zimmer and those guys, all, I mean, everybody pops into this place. So I had to be a tourist and do it. Mm. And I ate way too, way too much. Um, now, your Good father, you. your, but your father, if I, if, if what I'm seeing is correct, is Irish, correct? Mm-hmm. So, did now did you get any of the bangers and mash from his side? Uh, any kind of Irish? I cooking? love potatoes. I mean, look at me. <laughs> I love potatoes. <laughs> um, no, I mean, my dad. Let's see. I think actually, my dad thought we were Irish, and it's kind of inherent in our surname. But um, I did quite a bit of digging a few years back when I think it was like twenty nine or something like that. And uh, I found we were, he was estranged. He didn't know his um, paternal side of the family. And I found them because I'm um, elder millennial. So I'm really good at interneting. (laughs) And um, I found his entire paternal family, which is wild. Because I I also feel kind of disconnected from it. Even I can tell in the way I'm speaking about it. But um, yeah, I don't, I I don't, we're not actually Irish. We're Canadian. Mm -hmm through and through and through i mean all the way back into the 1800s i'm talking like poor living in a tar shack with 12 other people canadian Mm -hmm. so did you ever do that 23 and me or uh, ancestry thing Mm -hmm. yeah i did both uh just because i'm nerdy like that no i love that each one has an advantage i i still haven't sent mine in yet uh (laughs) side note uh my father passed from uh covid uh Mm -hmm. I'm losing track is a year and a half, two years ago. And, and then, so I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no, no. It was, you know, a lot of people, you know, dealt with that. And it was, uh, it was, it was a little surprising when I went to Dallas to had lunch with a cousin and she said, we uh, our dinner and we're all out eating. And she said, uh, by the way, I, I got something to tell you. Um, I did the 23 and me and, uh, just FYI, you have a sister. Like, I grew up as an only child, and we kind of found out I got a sibling. Like a half-sister? Uh, yeah. And that's, uh, and so I was like, Whoa. so that was like, you know, I guess I'm no longer an only child, technically, which is, you know, this would have yeah. been good years ago when I was growing up. I always wanted to have a sibling, and I know people that have siblings, like, no, I don't want a sibling, you know. Did you guys connect? We did. It was, it was, it happened to be on that same trip. It was really neat. So we had to change. And my father had already passed, so she was asking some questions. It was, it was it's a nice connection. She's got a family, and uh, she's couple years younger than me but she didn't understand how the connection happened and i put that i put that one together like mm-hmm. that for her so i kind of helped solve a little mystery for her and my my, my kid wow. my, my, so my kids were very like that's wild because that wouldn't expect that was going to be part of my family uh uh my um so he had a secret family n- well no he had a secret interlude uh that rendered uh, oh my god <laughs> and and the lady and I God bless her she's she's like listen my father you know he still believes that's his child and he I, she didn't have the heart to break it to him so it's a it's a little thing but it's it, you know that twenty three and me I'm going man the other stuff people must have found out about by going through this thing speaking of siblings mm-hmm. uh, did did you, did you grow up with any or are you an only kid that you know of I'm just kidding no. I'm totally joking. I- <laughs> No, um, I have an incredible younger brother. He's eight years my junior, and he is—he's um, just an exceptional young man. And it's been really cool because I left home when I was young, so he was eight when I left home. And getting to know him as an adult has been so cool. Like I would choose him as a friend, um, even if we weren't siblings, and. He was out in November to visit, and it really solidified our friendship our friendship and our bond. We visited like three different national parks. He stayed with me for about three weeks, and we just had such a blast together. And um, on my recent hiatus, we went down to Peru together. Really? His name's Colin. Yeah, oh, he's super I've cool. I've always wanted to go down to Peru. Oh, you should go. Uh, South America is so interesting. I've always wanted to travel there. But um, what does he do? Is he still in Canada, or did he move down here as well? Yeah, he he's in Calgary. He works in an ophthalmology clinic, and he um, he basically runs these tests in the back 
that determine what type of um, difficulty someone is struggling with, with their eyesight. And it was so fun listening to him talk about his job because I said, what do you find most interesting? Like what, what lights you up about it? And he was talking about how he learned, he was learning how to be like sensitive and graceful and patient because these elderly people would come in and get tested for glaucoma and it's like a beep test. So you see something and you got to press the button when you see it. And there's a particular cadence for the beeps. But sometimes people will come in and they're in total denial about the loss of their vision. And they'll just like press the button really rapidly because they're like, I'll catch it at some point. And then my brother has had to, and he says it happens rather frequently. And he'll, he's, he was talking about how he really finds joy in finding creative, loving and kind ways to explain to someone what to do without saying, hey, you're lying and, you know, do the test right. properly. You know, so he sounds like um, a very yeah, empathetic, uh, empathetic guy. He is. He is. Has any of your other family made it down to the U.S. or are they all still in uh, in Calgary? Everyone is still in Alberta. It would be nice to see my dad. I haven't seen him in a. I haven't seen my mom or my dad since before the lockdown. Oh my god! Really. Um, yeah, you know, it's so, been... Well, thank goodness for, like, Skype and stuff like that, or, or Zoom, or whatever have you. Yeah, yeah, it's been really nice. I mean, I, I certainly could have during the hiatus, but I, I really took our um, COVID compliance protocol quite seriously during work, and I just, I, I couldn't bear the thought of being the person that, like, shut the whole thing down. And so I, you know, even during Christmas, like, I just stayed in my little... LA house oh. and didn't go anywhere. And um, I, 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 I feel for you because I mean, for you, Christmas time growing up has to be vastly different. You know, just you have snow, you know, and here you are. This, <laughs> yeah. Um, but d- did y'all have those like COVID marshals or those people on set that you know mm-hmm. were like cracking whips? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. I was speaking with somebody yesterday. Who said they had people had vests on that either you know kind of policing things. Mm-hmm. Um, but as yeah. far as what do you what do your folks do up there? Uh, your your mom and dad. My mom works for this corporate company. They sell like really big blinds to, <laughs> to different like buildings, and my dad is an insurance adjuster, and he also has a really interesting lens on his profession because he's usually the first person that um, people who are in crisis and dealing with like loss of their stuff, especially when like floods and stuff happen or yeah, environmental issues. Oh, I was, I was there, uh, almost a year ago. Exactly. This is, this is a new studio here. My, I'm in new Orleans and hurricane Ida. Uh, my whole ceiling oh. in my place came down everywhere and it was just like <gasps> nuts. Uh, oh my God. And it sat there for like two, three weeks, and people don't realize with no AC, when you have that, it, it you walk in and mold is like, it's like kind of walk in and going, yep, making the call to State Farm. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, so, oh God. Oh, yeah, but, but I was, yeah. uh, I, I lived in uh, the Jimmy Buffett Margaritaville Resort in Biloxi, Mississippi for almost a month, which was kind of oh, cool, my actually. My, my golden retriever loved it. That is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the kids liked it also. But kind of going back a little bit more, in high school, what were you up to? Was this was acting or singing or any kind of performance on the radar? Uh, or were you sp- more of a sporty kind of a kid? Or what was going on then? I was your average overachiever renaissance person. I was like on the rugby, basketball Hang team. On, look, overachiever renaissance person. I've got to use that as my own <laughs> <Yeah>. definition. <laughs> Not just overachiever, your average overachiever, okay? Um, Because there's lots of us. So, yeah, I was, like, doing basketball and uh, rugby and track. Well, you did rugby? They have have girls rugby in Canada? Really? Yeah, of course. I'm I'm very fascinated by that. So, no (laughs) pads or anything? Y'all are just, you know, running into each other? Yeah, like knee pads. Yeah. I need to go to Canada. Y'all got stuff going on up there. I'm like, I don't think they do that here. Uh, but but I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I just heard rugby. I'm like, <laughs> it's okay. What? But that's great. So basketball. They do rugby. other things down here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was definitely into singing. I did vocal jazz and stuff. And I was always like scrouching. 
in the basement. Like I would get upset and I would go downstairs and I would sing along to Jackie Velasquez. What, what was that really word? Loudly. What was that word again? You were always what in the basement? Scrouching, scrouching, just like screaming. Oh, okay. My parents always thought I was just like screaming in the basement, but I was like singing. If I was feeling a lot that day, I would just go into the basement. I would sing. Um, and I kind of like snuck into a couple of talent shows and then that's, that's kind of how auditioning for Idol came around, but that kind of unfolded into, you know, what's happening now. What were you listening to in high school? What was your, uh, what were your jams? There were three albums I had on repeat all the time. I was listening to Robin, Bumpy Ride, amazing album. I was listening to Aaliyah, AJ Nothing But A Number. So like that really informed a lot of my music taste now. And then I was listening to Jackie Velasquez, who was this like really amazing Latin Christian singer. Really? And I just loved, I loved her voice. And then my mom had a cassette tape of Les Mis. And so it was really, oh yeah. And then we watched Jesus Christ Superstar almost every Easter. And really? so when I eventually did, yeah. <laughs> and when I eventually did those two Broadway shows, it was kind of, that's kind of like the transition into screen because I was, I had already done Les Mis in Canada and then also on Broadway. And then I was doing JCS and, oh no, flip it the other way around. I did JCS and then I was doing Les Mis and I was so like poor and hungry. I was living in East Harlem and you're working on Broadway and you think you're doing good and you're just so skinny because you're hungry (laughs) and you're always going to the laundromat. And I was so over it. Like I really just, there was, it was the first time, you know, people talk about the power of intention and being clear about what you want in life. And a lot of the time I feel very, I feel like the winds are kind of pushing at my back, moving me around to where I'm supposed to go. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time when I was in New York that I was just like, I'm done not having money. I don't like going to the laundromat. Isn't that nice to have that clarity though? When you, when you are go, okay, mm-hmm. this this chapter needs to close and there's something else yeah. when you, because sometimes yeah. that's, I think that's the hardest thing to do. It's like so many choices. What do you make? And then when you, it, what's uh, Sanford Meisner says, you know, act before you think your instincts are more honest than your thoughts in life. Mm-hmm. You got to listen to your instincts, I think as well, you know, mm-hmm. I think I saw it you know, into meditation and, and, and you're kind of like, you know, uh, I don't know how to kind of roll that up into a lifestyle, but, um, you're a little more, um, the word is escaping me now, but is that a big part of your life? Is that the, the meditation or the kind of that, 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 that kind of, uh, self learning thing? Yeah. I think it's like the most important thing. It's like why we're here, um, to do some remembering, but it requires a lot of, uh, uncovering to get to the heart of what's going on. But as it relates to acting, I mean, the more that you're able to fully live your life, and by that I mean be present for what's happening around you and also within you, the more I believe one is able to bring to a character, the more fully capable you are of embodying your life, including when you are avoiding yourself or experiencing emotions that maybe aren't as pleasant or kosher and you know um, neatly wrapped up. You know, the more capable you are of being present for the totality of your experience, the more honestly you can represent a person whose shoes you're stepping into. And so it's not so much a function of my profession that led me to that space. However, it is because of the abundance that I receive through my profession that I'm able to devote as much time um, to these practices that I feel help me be a better human being. And personally, I feel more equipped to approach my work in a way that makes me feel like I'm being honest, you know? Yeah. Nobody wants to feel like a faker when they are, you know, you're playing characters like, and, and in a way when you're doing that, it, it's, uh, I teach voiceover and uh, one of the things I tell people, it's like a flow, it's a vibe, you know, and it just comes out of you and you're not trying to do anything. And I think that it's funny you say that. I think that, that the gig kind of makes you do a little bit of evaluation and in, in other ways that 
benefit you in your own, you know, life outside of work, I think, mm -hmm. especially in this industry, you know, uh, now you, you said you're in New York on Broadway, which I think everybody thinks that's a pinnacle. You're on Broadway, but what was a lifestyle like living there? You know, you mentioned the laundry, but I mean, what's a lifestyle like as far as, as far as doing the, uh, uh, you know, doing the shows and how many days a week and, um, how much personal time do you have? What's it like if you're on an active Broadway production? Yeah, you're, you're doing eight shows a week. You don't have a personal life. <laughs> um, it's kind of impossible. I mean, you can have a personal life and it's very, it's quite the juggling act. And I really bow to people who are working on, who are working on Broadway and have like a family and everything. Um, Cause it's a really arduous schedule and you have to, especially if you're singing, you have to live saintly because your vocal cords are, I mean, you know, they're such a tender part of the body and you cannot abuse them if you want them to perform at, you know, near Olympian <laughs> um, feats. And like JCS and Les Mis, not for everybody, but for a great deal of the company, like it's their rock operas. You're doing a lot with your voice and you're feeling a lot. So most of the time, the schedule is really like go to work, sleep, sleep while you're there on double show days, go home, try to get in a workout, try to remember to eat. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're commuting a lot, but I love it. I love the bustle in New York. I feel a lot of resonance with um, the concentration of people who are on their way. And I feel like maybe not as much anymore, but I feel like there used to be this like New York, we get a bad rap about people being crusty, but it's not actually like that if you take the time to say hello and like make eye contact with yeah. somebody. Everyone is oh, so I've never cool. had an issue there. Yeah, I don't know why people think that. I think people are just, I think people are a little bit more honest and direct. Now, yeah. I'm from the South, and you know, whenever it says, oh, somebody says, oh, dear, bless your heart. They're not technically saying something nice, mm -hmm. you know. It's it, they're kind of like saying you are a dumbass, aren't you? Mm -hmm. No, that's kind of the uh, thing. Which in New York, people are just they'll say what's on their mind. And I appreciate. Mm -hmm. We actually, I was supposed to move up there. I remember September twelfth, two thousand one. We're supposed to move into a place called um, Liberty Plaza in Battery Park, and my ex wife and I were we're going to move in there. And clearly, everything happened that happened September eleventh, and. Went up there a month later. I was like, I was so amped about moving to New York. I was going to work uh, doing part time at a radio station, do voiceover, and hopefully act. And mm -hmm. and then I was like, Yeah, this for a new married couple, this is not a you know, you know, this, it's a little more rough of an atmosphere. But I, I can tell that when everything calmed down, it would just be a pretty magical place to live. If especially if you're in your early twenties, mm -hmm. I think that's an amazing time to to live in New York. Um, but making the transition to California was that was that based on you going I want to do on camera uh, or were you just kind of like I want to do something different how did how did you make that that um was it for a gig how did you make the move to LA well coming to LA wasn't my first on camera job um I was in New York when that happened and my dear agent who's like two months younger than me he had just taken over the film and television department and I'd been with the agency for several years and he was kind of like, why hasn't, why isn't Melissa auditioning for television? And he randomly sent me an email to which I replied, who is this? <laughs> I don't love when people do those like blind emails. It's like, it's nice to, you know, make introductions. In any case, um, those first two auditions he sent me, I screen tested for both of them and one I booked. And that brought me back to Canada where I filmed um, three years on this wicked show that I love so much called Dark Matter. We're just in sci-fi, uh, sci-fi land in space, kicking ass. And, um, and then when that closed out, there was like a summer where I was doing, you know, I was guest starring on different shows. And during the run of Dark Matter, um, the man who, Adam, who became my manager down here, he had been reaching out and he was like, you should come to LA. I would love to represent you. And I was like, I was very clear with him. I had no interest in like moving to LA to try to make a go of it. Like that's not in my blood. If, if I book a job, I will I will move, but I'm not going to completely ro relocate to the States to like try to make it happen. And um, there was this pilot that came on his desk and it was for the rookie and he was raving about it. He thought it was incredible. And it was the first time I had just lost my grandmother. And so I was in Calgary visiting my family 
And um, it was the first time that I actually involved my entire family in the process of doing a self tape. Like, I think my brother read with me, <laughs> my mom reviewed the takes, my dad looked at the takes and, you know, they didn't really know what they were commenting on, but they're like, it looks great, I guess. And I sent it off. And um, shortly thereafter, when I was in New York visiting with a friend, I got a call to head out to LA to do a chemistry test. And so I booked the rookie. And then I lived in an Airbnb for like a little while when we uh, shot the pilot and then that first season. And then I made the move down here properly in the second season. Yeah. What was it like, though? Because when you came on, you know, you had a relation. Your character had a relationship with Nathan Fillion's character, but he's also technically the boss or whatever, you know. And this is your first big U.S. show. What was that? Is it was that a little bit heady for you? Was that um, were there a lot of nerves or <laughs> what was it like? No, I mean, um, well, let's see. So in my audition which I was well prepped for, <clears throat> I completely was blanking on the entire content of my, my side of the scene in this chemistry test. And I was cold and I was tired and I just lost my grandma. <laughs> and in the middle of that, in the room filled with execs like ABC, all of the EPs, the showrunner, I, I was like, I got to do some squats. And, and I could tell everyone was like, uh, and I popped some squats. I popped some squats. I got some blood flowing and then I killed it in the next version of the scene that we did. Um, this is what I'm talking about with regards to what we were discussing a little while ago, as far as like being able to be with your experience, honor the truth of it and keep going. And I can't say that... Like, listen, I think Nathan is a very handsome and charming man. Does does his capacity as an executive producer or as my boss make me nervous? No. Um, and, it, and it wouldn't, no matter who it was, because at the end of the day, these are human beings the same way I'm a human being with my human experience. Um, and if there's like any takeaway for me that I would share in this space for anyone who's listening is that those anytime you get to a certain level, it's like everybody in the room wants you to win. They don't have you in there to like waste your time, waste their time. They want you to win. And so the important thing is to claim that space, do whatever you need to do to feel that you are at your best, including popping some squats, if that's what you need to do in a room filled with strangers and, um, and, and get there, like just get there. So no, and you know, it, it certainly doesn't hurt that they're all exceptionally kind human beings, you know. Um, I didn't ever feel strange. And I, I believe that that's equal parts, the frequency that you come into a space with, as well as how you're being received. Um, but to allow a bunch of strangers, regardless of their status, to kind of uh, impact your <laughs> central channel, I think is giving up power that you needn't do, you know, especially in an industry that needs to be self-propelled. I mean, that's um, maturity that has to have come through just doing it. What you're, I mean, like you said, going back to when you're on Broadway and, and even Canadian Idol and all that. I mean, that, that was obviously by then you're looking at this is a job, mm -hmm. but it's a big deal. A big network series, especially one going into season five. That's, that's, you know, that's the, that's the dream right there. Especially when you have like, well, how many episodes do y'all shoot a season, roughly? Well, I think it was like 18 and then 20 and then COVID was like 14 and then and yeah. then back to 20. I think, I think, I think. Yeah, because that's because now uh, I was speaking with someone yesterday who they're, they're doing something for one of the streamers mm -hmm. and that's eight to 10 episodes. So, you know, it's it's a little different of a, uh, a paradigm. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. different commitment. Um is it pretty rigorous doing a show that many episodes in a season? We met, you know, you mentioned the COVID thing, but outside of COVID, it, it, what's what's the workflow like for you? Are you working every uh, every day? I mean, I think in the first couple of seasons, it it felt a little bit more consistent because our our core group of characters was a smaller group, and as the seasons have gone on and we've added more characters that are central to the story and we have more regulars, it really has turned into an ensemble show. And so 
sometimes like let's say the episode is heavily featuring your character then yeah you might be in for every day that week are you going to be in top to bottom it's not likely but you might be in every day and then if you're light on the episode you might work anywhere from three days on that episode five days on that episode so it's been really neat to see the evolution of the show not only in what ends up being the end product but also with what it seems to me to be like this evolution of a work-life balance that is such an incredible luxury you know um and i think that comes from top down nathan's been doing this for a long time and he wants to have a balanced experience and so because that's being spoken about and discussed it it kind of trickles down to the rest of us as well which is like such a gift yeah i heard him in another interview and once again we gotta i gotta do some i would love to talk with him but it, it were a lot of sets i think he I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit i think i think any actor who's done this for a while has been on some gnarly uncomfortable you know uh, situations but i think he wanted kind of the antithesis of that i think he wanted this to be kind of more you know professional chill people with bad vibes don't you know it's not part of the ecosystem that he wants and you know and I, I it seems like being able to go to work and it's cool cool situation in and a great show and then being able to drive right back home you know you're not this is not like where you're staying at a hotel in some you know remote location shooting you know a film um what's that like to be able to just go right back home is it uh, is it something you prefer or do you kind of want to get out and, you know, do films and be on location and stuff like that? You know, I think my, my attitude towards it is similar to the feeling I have in an audition space, which is like, there is a, hmm, this is an interesting topic for me. On one hand, I have a very deep trust that what is for me is for me. And that if this is the experience I'm having, then there's lots to glean from it. And I try not to spend too much time going, oh, but it's not this and it's not that. And at the same time, I am coming around to understanding that there's a lot of value in aspiring for something. And when my thoughts drift into that space, I notice that my aspirations don't exist so much in my professional life as they do in um my life off camera, the experiential aspect of me. Professionally, I don't have aspirations so much of like, oh, I'd love to do like a film that's in Hawaii or something like that. Like that sounds great, but I'm not like pining for it. My professional pinings kind of lean towards um, content creation, which I have a hard time pulling the trigger on. Um, So yeah. I'm sure that would be great though. I love going home. I love going home. I'm a, I'm a homebody. I'm a Cancerian. I like to be at home. <laughs> well, I'm I'm, lear- I'm learning. I'm an Aquarian. I don't know what that means, but I know it's uh, um, the. Did you so? Did you say ooh? I said ooh. Oh, I, oh well, I thought I thought it was like oh, you're one of the who's. No, no. Um, <laughs> so, as far as con- when you say content creation, are you meaning just acting, or are you meaning like do you do other things creatively? What do you do? When you're not professionally creating, what do you, what do you like to do creation wise? Mm. Well, Besides making spring rolls, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, most of the time I'm reading, and I'm reading about all of the stuff that we've already discussed. I have a hard time with fiction, and yet I I have a lot of inspiration from my family. You know, not everybody's family life is going to be a good material for stories but i there's something in my mother's story in particular that i think would make a phenomenal short film and it's been something that i've been percolating with and i have like outlines and i start writing and then i get a little i have imposter syndrome when it comes to that space and i understand or rather I see and am rather intimidated by what appears to me to be like a mountain of a task to not only complete the writing of something, but then to step into the shoes of a producer and really like sell your idea to people and to make it happen. I think it's, uh, it looks like an incredible gauntlet, the people that do take it to completion. Um, And so it's something that I quietly am like, gosh, I would, I would love that. I would really like to 
set out the steps, the small attainable goals to complete something like that. Um, and I hope that as I mature, that I will uh, kind of shed these fears so that I can just get into executing and not thinking about it. I mean, it could just be a hobby right now. You yeah. Could, you could get final draft, put it on your computer or in just, yeah. just play with it and create. And I think that, mm -hmm. um, God, I was reading a, um, the books up here. Uh, save the cat about screenplay writing, uh, not too because I do that just kind of for fun, and I think it's just well, I don't know if I'll, I'll ever sell a screenplay, but there's something cathartic about sitting down. And you got a story, and how does it play out? You know, and I think just about everybody has imposter syndrome. I, I don't. I think every. I think a vast majority of the people you live around in L.A. probably have imposter syndrome, but you know, even people that are successful, I think that's kind of a component part. I think. I think if you don't have a little bit of like nerves that you know, something's, something's a little off, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, you you said your mother's story, she being from Hong Kong, but she left and she didn't really have a chance to kind of, in your, if I, am I right in saying she never had a chance to really make that connection to that being her lineage or place or, you know, having traditions and stuff like that. She really didn't absorb a lot of that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, without getting all the way into it, my mom ran away from home, um, and so, and, and where she landed was not with her family. And then she ended up, you know, getting pregnant by some white guy and had me. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's just, it feels like there's a lot of um, topical things, especially with regards to what's happening in the world these days. And um, yeah, the autonomy of a young woman who is trying to do something brave, albeit rebellious. I just, I think it's a really cool coming of age story. And it also happens to involve all of the things that I think are, um, that make a good story. Like youth, sex, drugs, love. <laughs> it's got all of it. <laughs> I think that'd be wonderful to tell that story though. You, you, should, you should put it together. Yeah. And that's so cool that it could be something from your family that you get to bring. Mm -hmm. It's not just something out of your imagination. Well, it is out of your imagination, but it's something uh, born of, you know, it's your mother's deal, you know, and you get to tell the story. And I think it's pretty fantastic. But that was great. I, I one of the things I, I want to do, and I always enjoy doing, is I always have my seven questions I like to ask as a kind of wrap up. It's just a little fun, additional get to know you. Uh, and the first question I always ask, because I'm always about the food, uh, is what is your favorite comfort food? That thing that it's like, and I'm sure you've you're deeply acquainted with it. I mean, COVID being at home, that thing it kind of kind of chills you out, brings you back home, makes you feel good. Huh? What is that? I'm sorry. Pho? Vietnamese? Pho? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Vietnamese noodles? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But what do you like in your pho, though? Are you a meatball person? You like the brisket? The... No. <laughs> you know, when I was a little kid, I definitely used to eat those, like, weird beef meatballs, but they're not actually beef. Mm -hmm. They're just, like, this, like, mashup of parts, probably. Um, <laughs> Bordeaux but... knows what it is, yeah. Yeah, but I love a good bone broth. You know, I really love a delicious... Actually, my favorite thing at a pho restaurant are the vermicelli bowls. Like I like a cold mm. noodle salad with like some spring rolls and then maybe like a little bit of chicken. I'm trying not to eat that much meat these days, but um, that like takes me home. Like I'm instantly in Calgary, in the Northeast, going somewhere. Somebody brings my dad a fork and he's like, I can use chopsticks. Like I can, it's like, I'm instantly <laughs> back there. So yeah. Uh, now on a scale of one to 10, where are you at on the spiciness though? It depends on my mood. I can go there. I can go there. Okay. <laughs> I can I've ruined there. other people's yeah. pho before because I'm like, oh, you got to try this. And, then, and they're like, try it. And they're like, I can't eat this. And they, I, I, I learned to not season other people's food anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can do that with my kids. You know, their big thing is Samba Olek. You know, it's kind of like just mm. it's it's it shows up in lots of stuff. So we, we yeah. can handle the spice. But I like I like the broth to be nice and spicy. You know, that's mm. my thing. Yum. But you can tell I haven't had lunch yet today, so mm -hmm. I'm talking about food. I morning, know. So. I'm sorry. That's my fault. No, 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 no. That's my fault. I just, I'm working like a fiend, you know. Um, now, if you were to sit down, like you had three people, you're going to be sitting down at a coffee shop, and it could be anybody, but you want to have four people, you and three people together, a few hours talking story. Who would those three people be, uh, you know, living or not? Ron Murphy. He's a director in Canada. He's an exceptional human being as well as a fantastic storyteller. 
he yeah he's incredible so that will only land with some people but it should land with everybody because ron murphy is an incredible human being um and then another guy i'm just gonna go at, it's another person nobody's gonna know uh his name is vlad he lives in peru and owns um this retreat center and this dude is czech but has lived in peru for the last 20 years and he is a deeply steeped person in psychedelic medicines and he is just mm -hmm. a fascinating human being with lots of uh, i don't want to say war stories but he is a journeyer and he's got some really amazing tales to tell oh i've always wanted to meet somebody like that uh more people. i i was a big like uh, uh, Anthony Bourdain was kind of my spirit animal. I always loved watching it. And I was like, mm -hmm. that's the job I want to go meet, go out into the world and meet these random people, you mm -hmm. know? Now, the next question I got is when you were young, who was your, your very first celebrity crush? <laughs> celebrity crush? Um, gosh, I don't know if I ever had one. If I had one, it was like a cartoon, maybe. I'm trying <laughs> to think of like the first. Like if I ever had that feeling about like, or, or, or maybe the first person or actor or whatever that you just like, you want to start following them that they, that, that, that something resonated with you when you were young. I've never oh, no, no, literally oh, following oh, them. Oh, but okay. I, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was at a concert. I'd never felt this before. And, and at this point, you know, cause we did Canadian Idol and we like met some personalities, you know? And mm -hmm. I remember each time people would like freak out and I didn't really have a thing. And then one time, I was I went to a concert and it was a Janet Jackson concert and I was like this is fine this is cool and then she walked out on stage and I had that thing that you see some people have where they're like they're wow. having a hard time breathing and their chest feels funny I had that with Janet Jackson <laughs> like when I saw her come out I was oh like, really oh like yeah I my body started doing something that I didn't understand like physiologically like I just my, <laughs> it was hard to breathe I was so far away from her but it was like actually Janet in the flesh it was so strange and I, part of what made it worse was that I was noticing it and I was, all I could think was like, what is happening to my body right now? But um, yeah, I don't know if I've ever had a crush though. A big part of me having that sensation is like, I, I, I kind of like, I get crushes and I fall in love with like personalities, you know? Um, so oh, yeah. like, like the actual person. So yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I like that. You know, I, I, I remember seeing Janet Jackson's, uh, God, I many back in my radio days. Anyway, she was uh, amazing. Her con she did a great, it was, uh, it was, I remember black cat was a song she was playing mm -hmm. anyway, but she is a, sh a show person. Most certainly. Um, yeah. now let's say you're going to be living on an exotic Island. Next question is wrapping up it's an island you want to be on for a year it's it's beautiful it's awesome but no streaming no internet no nothing so you gotta oh, bring i was like i was like there's no water <laughs> no <laughs> okay it's it's time for you la people to rough it no i'm just kidding um no it's no you have everything it's a resort it could be just you know something amazing but there is no way to listen to music or watch movies or anything so you got to bring one uh, cd with you one album and one dvd a movie what would that cd and movie be to kind of you can kind of tap into for your entire year. Oh boy. Okay. Let's see a CD. <laughs> uh, I think a CD. <laughs> It'd be so awesome. If you said one of mine. No, <laughs> no. Oh, God. no. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> um, Oh man, like my brain, I want to say something like super cool and moody and current, but I think you need like all of the colors sometimes. And so I would probably choose like, a, like the game, maybe like Queen, the game. I love that album. Oh yeah. It's got like, every, it has everything in it. You know what I mean? Or, or. Or the miseducation of Lauren Hill. Like the, my favorite song on on the game, besides them having all of the crazy hits, is "Sail Away, Sweet Sister." Oh my god, that song! Like it's got the ballads, it's got the stuff when you need to chop wood, and you're like, yeah, you know, like it has all of the things that you might <laughs> want to experience and feel supported in. But I would also. What say part of LA are you living in? Where you chopping wood? I'm just kind of curious. That's, I'm that's... on an island now. This is your hypothetical. Oh, oh, oh! That's right. That's right. I, I <laughs> thought that you had some about. wood chopping. Okay, you're chopping up a palm tree, and yeah, you're, okay, I got you. Because I need fire, and um, 
And uh, so, okay, so a DVD. So if I'm practical, oh, I that, would that's say... That's funny you say that. I forgot that that album was so eclectic. Good. It was... Uh, yeah, really yeah that was, that's awesome. I like that. Yeah, it's a good album. But go um, on. I'm sorry. It's okay. And if I'm going to do a DVD, I'd say, like, maybe, depending on the island I'm stranded on, I would get, like, one of the seasons of Alone so I could, like, learn <laughs> from them. Have, do you watch that show? Alone? No. No, no. What's... Uh... Oh, my God, Mark. What I feel like I have a doing? homework assignment now. Yeah, no, you really do. Watch season eight first. So Alone, it's kind of like Naked and Afraid, but way better because people aren't naked. And also everything they have to do, everything they film, they have to film it themselves. They're survivalists. They get dropped off in these different places. They got Patagonia one year, BC, Alaska twice. And like whoever makes it in the most recent seasons, whoever makes it like a hundred days, you have to build your own shelter. You have to catch your own food, everything. You have to do everything by yourself. So I would have a DVD of that so that I could make sure that I don't die and just like learn from them. Um, or um, Sunseed, which is a really lovely DVD compilation of a lot of spiritual teachers so that I could continue learning and unfolding. <laughs> That's I'm I'm so fascinated. It's like you're such a pleasure to you know of all the people I've spoken with. Not I've, had, I've spoken with wonderful people. Very fascinating. But do but I win? I, like, do I win the competition? The, the, you you win. Actually, I was thinking of something. I got this little thing in South Padre Island. We have a we go down there every year. It's South Texas coast. You know, my kids and I. And I found this little thing. It's almost like uh and and the late I went into this place and I'll show you in a second. Okay. And she and I was looking for something. I got tchotchkes and stuff all over my desk and Ooh. all over my speakers. And I found this neat little thing. It's each little stone. I'll I'll go and show you. I don't know if you can if my camera will zoom. Each one of those is a different kind of stone. Oh, oh uh, which has different the, vibratory. The, the, yeah, 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 yeah. And at the very top is some kind of energy coil. So I, how much do I believe? I don't, I just thought it looked really cool. I sit there and everything cool. you're saying is like that's the kind of stuff I imagine finding around your house. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like you're. <laughs> yeah, I know you can kind of see some of my stations set up. Um, I do have some. I have some tragedies. I have some sacred things. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very cool. I like somebody the introspect. I like being reminded that you need to do that because sometimes mm -hmm. we get so knee deep in our lives, we kind of forget. You got to take a moment. We all need reminders. Absolutely. Um, now, mm -hmm. if uh, not, last a couple of questions. If, if you weren't doing this for a living, if if acting, singing, creative was not uh, performing was not part of your ecosystem, what would or that you were doing? What would you be doing for a job? What would your career be? You know, I feel really drawn to being a student <laughs> and I know that I wouldn't be able to do that like endlessly. If that could be a career, I would, I would, I would make a career out of like endlessly being a student and maybe I would be maybe like a recluse, but I have been told from a psychic that I, and I did not ask for this. She looked at me very pointedly and she was like, do not go to a monastery. You're not supposed to do that. And I was like, how did you know? Like, I felt like a rat. Like, I was just, like, caught in the light. And, um, yeah, I would want to be a student, like, endlessly. And then and to probably just, like, be in service. I mean, that's the ideal. And I guess if I have to make money, I wouldn't mind going back to school so that I could um, explore Chinese medicine. I find it really fascinating. And it's a really oh, yeah. interesting, like, synthesis of you know, spirit, physical things, and also cosmological information. Like it's this totally harmonized system um, to bring people into wellness on all levels. And so Even food, there is they yeah. view food as medicine as mm -hmm. well, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's, that's fascinating. So you'd be in school, but I think also teaching, it sounds like would be something, you know, being a teacher and being able to pass along the stuff you learn sounds like something you'd be doing. Um, if I was, I would be likely doing it reluctantly. <laughs> really? I think so. Well, you got to share your wisdom. Uh, it's important stuff. You know, give it to the rest of us so we can pass, you know, the pay it forward thing, you know. Um, now, the last question, if you're to jump in your DeLorean, you can go back to when you're 16 <laughs> years old. Okay. And, you know, you can you can cruise back and you got a piece of advice for, you know, you got a few minutes with 16-year-old you. Uh, and you want to get 16 year old you let's say on a better track or maybe help just in general terms what would that piece of advice be that would be of real value at, uh, for 16 year old Melissa 
Um, you are not your body. Stop stressing out. Just feed it well. Make sure you move it. But don't obsess over it. It's going to be okay. That's a very common thing yeah. that I hear. But it's not, if it's said in different ways, but it's the same thing. It's going to be okay. Or another thing I hear a lot is, uh, and this alludes to something you said earlier, uh, but the idea of don't wait. You know, do it, you know, mm-hmm. uh, when you were talking about writing and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like, just do that thing. You know, I, you know, I, I can't tell you how much of a, a real pleasure it is to you know, sit down with you today. And I and I didn't I didn't ask a single thing about what's going to be going on with you and Tim this season. I did. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. Honestly was like, I was like, this guy doesn't even watch the show. He's never even asked about Eric or Tim. Like, oh, I don't even know what's oh, going on. Oh, God, no. <laughs> you know, I, you know, the. the Trust me, I, I, the the way the season ended last year, my kids, it's our, my kids and I, it's our, the show we always watch. And as you see our DVR, because my daughter is off at, you know, uh, was off at college, is like letting all the all the rookies just stack up, you know. Mm. I do have to say, just one last note. I, I love the way the relationship, uh, be it the writing and the, the relationship the two of you had with Eric Winter. Mm. Um. The way it's evolved from him calling you boot and all that stuff, you know, the, kind of the way they did, to now you're passing a little wisdom on to him in some way. Mm. It was just an evolution. And like I say, I want to get su- be surprised like everybody else and all like spoilers, but you know, seeing where things are, you know, going, it's, uh, you know, I think, uh, Rosalind Sanchez might be having some issues with you. So I just, I just, an, an <laughs> no assumption. Way! she loved me. I love her. <laughs> if anything, I'm, I'm always like, I'm always like, I'm when we're at work, I'm constantly trying to like help Eric spend his money on Rosalind. Cause I like, I, you know, I'm not immune to it. I'm trying to stay off my phone more, but like, you know how Instagram is these days. They're just constantly selling you stuff. And for some reason, yeah. you know, like I'll see the stuff they're trying to sell me. And I don't really know a lot of people with those body types, but Rosalind has like, she looks like a model. Like, I mean, she is a model. And I'm like, Eric, you should get this for Rosalind. She would look good in it. <laughs> I'm constantly <laughs> trying to get him to buy like outfits and jewelry for her. Cause I'm like, she would look amazing. So no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just think I think that show's got to be so much fun uh, to shoot. Uh, you know, it's just the fact that you're living in a city where you're also shooting it. It's it's one of the few shows where L.A. is part, one of the characters in the show, and yeah. it's it's like, you know, it's just I imagine the downtime. Um, you know, you have a pretty nice constellation of characters and personalities, and we'll send you some New Orleans food or something. Uh, yeah. You know, if you can tell, you know, do a little do a little do a little bump over to you know to your to your boss and say, Hey, I talked to this guy I really wants to talk to you. No, okay. um, cause <laughs> no, because y'all both had that sci-fi background, you know, which is kind of yes, cool. You know, the, uh, yeah. But, uh, but no, I, again, I, I, I really appreciate you taking time out. I think my kids will finally think I'm cool after speaking with you. Um, uh, maybe I'll get closer to cool, but, uh, mm-hmm. but it's certainly looking forward to this season and love the, the character arc. And, and I think though I, don't like necessarily cliffhangers and make you wait for months to figure out what happened. I was like, okay, this, this has been, I, I want to see where this goes. You know, mm-hmm. there you go. The, the, you're, you're creative. You need to get out there and write that screenplay. Um, <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> if I ever bump into you in the streets of LA, when I'm out there in a couple months, I'll be like, how's that screenplay coming? You know, I'll be that one annoying person that the car, that karmically, that I just keep showing up and bugging mm-hmm. you next, thing you know, that'll be a big, uh, Big well, hey, for, do uh, let me know if you're ever in L.A. I'd love to serve you tea sometime. What's your favorite tea, though? I like show pueres. Uh, no, I have to go do research on that. Uh, <laughs> sure. I was thinking like matcha, you know. <laughs> I, I'm going I mean, basic, it's you know. Definitely, no, we're ta- we are talking about tea ceremony, though, too, so you're not all the way off. Oh, yet. I've always wanted to, to, to take part in something like that. Either. I just think there's something very civilized about me. I'm just drinking my... Yeah you know, a gallon of coffee here. It's all good. Yeah. Again, I, I appreciate your time and look forward to the, uh, the upcoming season and, uh, hopefully, uh, down the line, we'll have a chance, chance to connect. I'll, uh, maybe one day we'll do the tea. How about that? Yes. Let me know if you're in LA. That's not an empty invitation. Melissa, health, happiness, prosperity to you. And I look forward to catching up with you down the line. And you as well. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, there you go. Melissa O'Neill. So enjoyed this chat. Really had a great time getting to know Melissa. You know, she she has such a great story and I love her energy, her vibe. Uh, I really am uh, glad I had the chance to share this conversation with you.
And I appreciate you coming back by every week. Great conversations on the way. And of course, as always, pop on by storyandcraftpod.com. Uh, you can find out anything you could possibly want to know about the show, listen to past episodes. Uh, and don't forget, you can also listen to the show on your favorite podcast app. So listen, subscribe, like. That way you get notifications every time a new episode comes out. And don't forget, if you can, if you would, drop a little review in there. Appreciate it, if you would. All right, so please go have a safe and awesome rest of your week. And I'll see you next time right here on Story and Craft. That's it for this episode of Story and Craft. Join Mark next week for more conversation right here on Story and Craft. Story and Craft is a presentation of Mark Preston Productions, LLC. Executive producer is Mark Preston. Associate producer is Zachary Holden. Please rate and review Story and Craft on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to show updates and stay in the know. Just head to storyandcraftpod.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'm Emma Dillon. See you next time. And remember, keep telling your story. Come on.